Welcome to episode 23 of the Auto Drive Mustang Conversion Project, Project Traction. This is my attempt to make an American GTR. Basically a boosted V8 version of an R34 GTR incorporating a manual transmission and a variable torque split uh, transfer case. The last episode covered the modifications to the front cross member including making clearance for the CV axles but uh, more importantly and much more difficult was relocating the rack and pinion to get clearance for the CV axles and more importantly to get clearance for the front differential. This episode is going to follow on directly from that. Um, the relocated rack required lengthening the, uh, the steering shaft between the, the firewall and the rack and pinion. So there's a lot to cover. Let's get right into it. So this is the lower steering shaft. This, this side here goes into the rack and pinion and this goes into a U-joint right at the firewall area. Um, it obviously is meant to collapse. I need it to be, I don't know, like a half inch to an inch longer. And so I'm going to cut it here and probably sleeve the outside so it can still collapse. We'll see once I cut it open. It's for sure hollow. I probably can't see in there, but it's for sure hollow so all this stuff can collapse in on itself. Um, so if I cut it here, make a tube, and uh, weld it back together, I should be able to solve my length issue. After cutting the shaft, I machined a tight fitting sleeve to go over it. To keep everything running true, I put the end of the steering shaft in a four jaw chuck and dialed it in to minimize the run out. I then put the tube in a rotating tailstock chuck and proceeded to tack everything together. The rotating tailstock chuck is a tool I've been lusting after for quite a while for this very purpose. I picked up this unit on AliExpress and it has served me very well. It allows you to hold parts without a center, uh, true, and rotate them for machining or in this case, welding. The idea behind the sleeve is not just to reinforce the shaft, but to allow me to adjust the length after mocking it up in the car. The steering column itself does have some play. You can compress it to install the shaft, but the length of the shaft still has to be pretty close. So to weld up the steering link here, I basically got the rack, I took the rack boots back off again and measured back and forth until I got the rack perfectly centered. And then I have a bungee cord on the steering wheel to make sure the steering wheel is straight. And now I mark the steering shaft so I can take it off and put it in my little welding lathe fixture. Once again, you can really see how this rotating tailstock chuck really comes in handy to keep everything straight. Just make sure that if you use your lathe for welding that you ground the part you're welding directly, or at least a chuck. You don't want welding uh, current to go through the bearings of the lathe. Here's the completed uh, steering shaft, made about, I don't know, probably about a half inch longer than stock, all cleaned up and painted. You can see the welds turned out really nice, and the whole lathe trick turned out great. It runs really quite true, and I you know, kept the collapsible section from a safety standpoint. So ready to go back in the car, another big step. The shaft fits great and there's plenty of clearance even with the relocated rack and uh, we can move on to the next task. This is the part of the project where I had to make a decision on what I wanted for a final drive ratio in the front and rear differentials. I originally purposely bought a performance pack car so it would come with the 373 rear uh, uh, Torsen differential. And the Toyota differential that I decided to use in the front, they basically all come with 410 gears in them. And my original plan was to swap those gears for 373s. They're actually pretty hard to find. Um, there's really no aftermarket application for them because all of the four-wheel drive type people actually go to, to something numerically higher like 456s. So I was stuck trying to find some used ones. And the funny story is, is the only really easy to find application was uh, an early 90s Toyota Previa supercharged is the key uh, all-wheel drive van, the rear diff. And so I do have a set of those gears. But after all that, I realized that with the switch to the TR6060, I was probably better off keeping the, the 
four tens in the front and making them the rear match. Now they don't actually don't make four tens for the Super 8.8 .8 that's in the S550 Mustangs. The closest thing they have is a 409 that Ford Motorsport sells. But if you do the math on that, it's only about a 0.2% difference, which is really minuscule. It's less than the equivalent to a sixteenth of an inch difference in diameter on, on the wheels. So the question is, is why do I think 410s are better? Well, simply going from the MT82 with the its 3.66 uh, to 1 first gear ratio to the TR6060 with its 2.95 uh, first gear ratio, actually 2.97, excuse me, first gear ratio, a lot of a, I lost a great deal of torque multiplication. Um, actually, even with the 410s, my overall gear ratio is lower than the MT82. Uh, with the 0.56 gear, the engine will actually be turning slower than the OEM setup on the highway, even with the 410s. Now, I know what you're thinking. The internet's going to explode here because the common consensus is that if you're going to boost a car, which is my plan after the all-wheel drive uh, is working, that you want a numerically lower gear. But as you can see in this table, uh, in, in the columns in yellow, that it, once again, even with the 410 gears, uh, my overall gear ratios are actually equivalent to a MT82 with 331s. And so, well, maybe the internet is right after after all. So basically, I'm going to be mimicking an MT82 with 331s. Anyways, I hope that makes sense. I got a little long-winded, but that was, of course, all this required, you know, a whole step. I had to take the differential out of the car and then get the gear swapped. And after getting some quotes, I ultimately decided to do it myself. Uh, a friend helped me do that. So, anyways, let's get into that. I need to re-gear the differential, you know, the rear differential to match the front, but the, <laughs> while it's out, I want to do something about this thing. You know, obviously I'm going to put new seals in it. It was, you know, leaking a little bit, but the non-GT350s in the 15 and 17s, they didn't paint the differential, the iron differential, and it's just kind of like the exhaust, where the car in general is in pretty good shape for having seen two winners. This diff really got pummeled. There's just rust flaking off of it. So um, I'm going to do the whole wire wheel thing while it's still together so you don't get dirt on the inside. And then uh, pour 15 in just like the front diff, which turned out uh, beautiful, if I'm going to say so myself here. So anyways, uh, I'm not going to show that whole process, but I wanted to show a before, then I'll show an after to kind of get an idea of how crusty this thing was. And after lots of elbow grease, I got the diff housing prepped for some port 15. And here is the completed diff. I can't believe how it turned out. It really looks great compared to how it all started out. I want to give a huge shout out to Derek for helping me swap the gears and keeping this project moving along. Then the arduous task of getting the rear diff back in the car started. Uh, thanks to Harold for stepping in to give me a hand. Uh, he has uh, absolutely been critical to this whole project kind of behind the scenes. Next on the to-do list was putting the struts together for the final assembly of the front suspension. I worked with a company called Ground Control to have these special short strut bodies made. They're about an inch and a half shorter than stock to allow for the raised strut mount on the spindles required to clear the CV joints. I soon realized that the extra long springs I requested were not going to be easy to install. This is a common problem with coilovers. To keep the springs short, many manufacturers provide really stiff springs, much stiffer than I wanted. The stock springs on a Mustang are about 160 pounds per inch. I wanted to increase that to about something in the 250 pound inch range and ended up with a 9 inch long 275 pound inch spring to get the suspension treble correct without binding. 
Six inch springs are pretty common in coilovers. The nine inch springs I requested didn't allow the springs to be installed without being pre-compressed. To get the springs on I had to heavily modify a set of Harbor Freight coil spring compressors to work with a much smaller spring diameter. This took me the better part of a day, but I ended up working pretty well and allowed me to get the springs on, the struts, and get everything put together with the camber plates. Well, that's a wrap on episode 23 of the all-wheel drive Mustang project, Project Traction. You may be wondering, how much is actually left to get this thing on the wheels in all-wheel drive mode? Uh, well, I, I will say that it will be all-wheel drive and on the wheels before I'm uh, out of season here in Minnesota. I didn't film it, but actually after getting everything done in this video, I did actually drive it around to make sure the suspension was good and all the geometry is correct. I actually brought it in and got it aligned and it was completely uneventful. Um, it, but it, you know, it, it didn't have front axles in it, but it did have the front diff, the, the new oil pan, the relocated rack, and the oil pan didn't leak. That's amazing, right? And so everything, everything was great. And so the only real issue was I'm a little disappointed the BMR engine mounts I used, you know, I had to use much shorter engine mounts to clear the CV axles are really way too stiff and they add a lot of vibration to the car so a, a winter project will be making some lower durometer pucks to put in those engine mounts to make it a little less NVH if you will. So the list of things that actually it still needs to happen before it's all wheel drive uh, include making a new front differential cover. cover. I'm going to make that out of billet aluminum just because I really want to. Um, and then fabricating the jack shaft, which is the shaft that goes through the oil pan. And then making, of course, the front CV shafts and putting them together to make the axles. Um, getting the front sway bar to clear those axles. Uh, finalizing and getting the front drive shaft made. Um, and then making, I need to make a, the current plan then is to make a puck that goes um, from the transfer case to the drive shaft and then you got to mod the exhaust to clear the drive shaft I have mocked that up and the catalytic converter will hit the drive shaft for sure so I got to fix that then once all that's complete and if that goes smooth I need to actually install a controller to control the transfer case this is a variable torque split transfer case so unless you put power to it it basically it's rear wheel drive so how long is that going to take well I've been thrashing to get all this stuff done and spoiler alert I am way behind on these videos from where I actually am and there's a reason why the car is sitting behind me on the ground. Um, so if you want to see the world's first all-wheel drive uh, S550 Mustang please like and subscribe and hit the bell because more episodes are coming with lots of progress. And so, once again, I appreciate you watching, and until next time.